Um, I'm just up here for a moment. I'm Lee Hasselbeck. I work with the section of family planning, doing policy work there. But I'm mainly here to introduce Professor Colleen Grogan, who's going to moderate our uh, panel and final set of speakers for the day. Um, Professor Grogan uh, is in the School of Social Service Administration here at the University of Chicago. Her area of re uh, research interests include health policy, health politics, participatory processes, um, and the American welfare state. She recently co-authored a book with Michael Guzmano entitled Healthy Voice, Unhealthy Silence, Advocating for Poor People's Health. With this book, it explores uh, efforts to include representatives of the poor and disadvantaged in health policy decision making. Professor Grogan is currently working on a book titled America's Hidden Healthcare State, which examines and exposes the historic evolution of public health care spending through private entities in the US healthcare system. Her recent work also focuses on the politics of state children's health insurance programs and analyzes individual effects of securing public insurance. She is editor of the Journal of Health Politics, Policy, and Law, which is working with us in this conference and will produce um, a special issue following it. Her first special issue uh, is forthcoming, and it's entitled Critical Essays on Healthcare Reform, and that'll be in June 2011. Professor Grogan is also the academic chair of the Graduate Program in Health Administration and Policy, and co-chair of the Center for Health Administration Studies at the University of Chicago. So join me in welcoming her. Thank you very much. I really don't feel that I deserve that very nice introduction given my very minor role <laughs> um, in, this, uh, in this wonderful conference today. Everybody else has done uh, really such a wonderful job bringing their expertise to the table. Um, this last panel that we have for today is really, I think, a fantastic panel. Um, and I know everyone's getting tired when we're all so sedentary all day sitting and listening, but if you can kind of hang in there, um, I think it's uh, well worth it. Um, many times throughout the day, we've been talking about um, how important it is to understand sort of the details of healthcare reform because um, if we there's lots of really important implementation questions going forward and lots of people if we don't kind of stay on top of it and really advocate for things um, lots of people are falling through the cracks and I sort of see these papers as each sort of showing us the different ways of different populations and different groups that we should really be kind of keen in on and so um, so th this is really um, an important set of topics and papers um, papers that you're not seeing right now, but that will come out of these talks today. Um, so uh, the first... Um the, the first presenter um, is Amanda um, Dennis, and she is a senior project manager at IBIS Reproductive Health. Um, she received her BA from Hampshire College and her Master's of Bioethics um, from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Ms. Dennis is presently pursuing her doctorate in public health at Boston University um, and focusing on social and behavioral aspects for healthcare. So it's really wonderful to have um, a young and developing scholar here as well, and, and she um, uh, uh, is uh, currently manages IBIS's research on, Hy on the Hyde Amendment um, and U.S. federal abortion funding bans, as well as um, several projects focused on contraceptive access in the U.S. Her other research interests include disability rights and healthcare disparities. So please welcome Amanda Dennis. So hi, everyone. I am uh, very excited and humbled to be here among these uh, fabulous speakers that we've had throughout the day. Um, so thank you to the folks who organized this conference and who sponsored the conference for having me here. And thank you to this morning's speakers for doing the heavy lifting and laying out uh, national health care reform uh, and reproductive justice. I'm going to take off a smaller bite and look at what's happening in Massachusetts. Um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge all the people who contributed to the project that I'm going to talk about today, uh, IBIS Reproductive Health and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Family Planning Program really work collaboratively on this project from start to finish. Today what I'll do is give you some background about healthcare reform in Massachusetts. I'll discuss the research that we conducted about healthcare reform. Um, I'll outline our findings and some implications we see from this research, both for reform in Massachusetts at the state level, but also for national health care reform. So, first, some background. Before health care reform was passed in Massachusetts, we really had a robust public health system in place that was, was and continues to be supportive of women's health um, in a number of different ways. First, we've historically had very few residents who were uninsured. 
There's a very robust network of family planning providers throughout the state. There's also pretty generous coverage of reproductive health care, both among private health insurance plans and among public health insurance plans. In 2003, contraceptive equity regulations were passed, and those regulations require insurers, provide, insurers that provide outpatient benefits cover hormonal replacement therapy and all FDA-approved contraceptive methods. Um, finally, insurers that provide pregnancy-related benefits must also provide coverage for the diagnosis and treatment of infertility. So you can see we had a lot of uh, nice measures in place to ensure access to reproductive health care uh, for the population before reform. Um, reform, or Chapter 58, as we often call it, was passed in Massachusetts in 2006 with the aim of improving access to comprehensive health care by increasing health insurance coverage, restoring previously cut programs, expanding access to Medicaid, and improving health care quality. And there are several complex pieces to the legislation, um, and I'll just mention a few of them here. First, all residents of Massachusetts were mandated to obtain health insurance uh, or apply for a hardship waiver exempting them from that requirement. Reform also included fines for employers of 11 or more employees who did not insure their workers, expansion of public health programs, and insurance market reforms. Chapter 58 also established the Health Connector, which is an independent state agency that does several things, including administering some of the key aspects of health care reform. And finally, reform led to the launch of subsidized, private, subsidized, publicly subsidized private health insurance plans for low-income residents, and that those insurance plans are known as the Commonwealth Care Plans. So to give you a little bit more detail about the Commonwealth Care Plans, they are a subsidized, low or no-cost insurance program for low-income residents. To qualify for the plans, an individual must be a Massachusetts resident with an income at or below 300% of the federal poverty level. They can't have access to employer-sponsored health insurance, and they can't be eligible for other public health insurance programs like MassHealth, which is Massachusetts Medicaid. There are now five different Commonwealth care plans, and though there are some, di some differences among them, they have relatively similar benefits and similar costs. Um, none of the plans have deductibles, and the premiums and co-pays vary based on an individual's income, kind of on a sliding scale. So with just a few years of experience, we've already seen some considerable success with reform. In particular, the rate of folks who are uninsured has dropped dramatically. Over 400,000 Massachusetts residents have been newly insured since reform was put into place, leaving Massachusetts now at the highest rate of residents insured in the country. And as you can see from this graph, we only have 2% of our residents who've been left uninsured as of this year. Of the newly insured, most of the increased coverage since reform has been through public health programs like MassHealth and Commonwealth Care, and those two pu public health programs alone have insured almost 80% of those newly insured. Uh, I do want to note, though, that this was preceded by an increase in employer-sponsored insurance, which has since declined as a result of the recession. So when IVIS Reproductive Health and the Department of Family Planning came together, we had one overall question about reform, and that, has, that was, what was the impact on the folks who were used to accessing care through the public health infrastructure to gaining access to these new health insurance plans and accessing care using these subsidized private health insurance programs? Some of our speakers this morning were talking about the importance of transitions, and this was one of those. We were also curious to know what was happening to the public health care providers who were providing care for low-income folks and how they were affected by health care reform. And within that question, we had specific concerns about access to contraception and other reproductive health services, as well as the impact on service delivery for family planning providers in the Commonwealth. So we had a four-part data collection plan. Um, first, we conducted a systematic desk review of the Commonwealth care plans. We also surveyed and, administ and interviewed administrators and clinic staff at the family planning clinics. Finally, we conducted nine focus groups uh, with English and Spanish-speaking women across Massachusetts. For the systematic desk review of the Commonwealth Care Plan websites, we really approached each of the websites as if we were someone who was not insured and was interested in becoming insured um, to figure out what the process was to do that, what benefits we would get, what it would cost us. Um, we also generally assess the ease and usability of each of the websites. For the surveys and in-depth interviews of family planning providers, we collected their demographic information, information on their practice characteristics. We asked them about their knowledge and opinions of healthcare reform. 
their relationship with the Commonwealth Care Plans, the different billing and reimbursement practices that were necessary with each of the plans, their contraception prescribing practices and how those were affected by reform, and also their perception of how healthcare reform had impacted their clients and women in their community. Um, for the focus groups, we started each focus group by giving just a brief description of what healthcare reform meant in Massachusetts. And we asked participants about their opinions of healthcare reform, their health insurance history, what their opinions of different health insurance aspects of health insurance are, what contraception they use, their experience getting contraception, and any changes they've noticed in accessing healthcare services since reform. Uh, and this is a look at where we conducted the focus groups. Um, you can see that most of them were conducted in or around Boston. Um, but we had a, a decent geographic spread of focus groups with the exception of Southeast Massachusetts and rural areas. So to give you a look at our findings, overall we found that insurance has led to improvements in access to preventative, routine, and emergency healthcare services. Many of the women in the focus group said they were grateful to have insurance, they considered it a lifesaver, it gave them peace of mind. Likewise the, family, likewise, the family planning providers reported seeing increases in access to insurance, which resulted in increases in access to services among their clients. However, uh, we also saw a number of challenges uh, for those who are eligible to insurance in translating the availability of insurance coverage to accessing care. First, there were just challenges just getting on the insurance programs, and those challenges were related to understanding what it took to be eligible to enroll and to stay on the plans, and I'll talk more about those challenges um, a little bit later. We also identified a number of challenges to accessing care. Uh, first, because so many people are now insured, but so few providers accept the new subsidized insurance plans, it can be difficult to find a provider who accepts your plan and to schedule a timely appointment with them. Also, because many of the women we spoke to had never been on insurance before, um, they had difficulties understanding exactly what their prescription benefits were and how to access them. Uh, and then I'll just say our findings about afford affordability were mixed. Um, most of the women in the focus group said that one of the primary benefits of reform was the affordability of prescriptions and healthcare visits. Uh, but our family planning providers were telling us that they were seeing a lot of women who were experiencing a lot of challenges paying for services under health care reform. Um, and we think the reason for that is is that the women in our focus groups were really uh, some of the most low income women uh, and they were paying zero to three dollars for their co-pays. Um, women who with higher incomes who are paying up to fifty dollars for their co-pays uh, likely have different experiences with affordability. And although health care reform has led to improvements uh, for many women, in Massachusetts, access to healthcare has not improved or has gotten worse for some populations. These groups of women, um, the groups women and providers felt faced barriers to accessing care under reform were remarkably similar. So immigrants, young women and minors, those not living in urban areas, and women going through common life transitions that really caused them to turn on and off the insurance plans. Women in the focus groups were often describing first-hand accounts of their own experiences accessing, health, accessing healthcare since reform took place, but they were also reflecting on the experiences of women in their community. Providers, on the other hand, were highlighting the challenges of meeting the needs of specific groups of populations when providing those services. So I'll, far, I'll start first with uh, looking at the immigrant population in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts has the eighth largest proportion of immigrants in the U.S. The population is made up of a significant proportion of young people of reproductive age, with just over half of the population being women. Latinos comprise the largest group of immigrants in Massachusetts and also comprise the largest group of recently established immigrants who are least likely to be eligible for insurance. And recent estimates suggest that Latinos are uninsured at over twice the rate of their non-Latino counterparts. So we found that reform had spurred tremendous misinformation about the availability of health care and insurance coverage, both for documented and undocumented immigrants in Massachusetts. Um, so the women in our focus groups, all self, in our Spanish language focus groups, all self-identified as Latina, and we had two Latinas in our English language focus groups. The four primary challenges we documented to accessing health care for immigrants generally and foreign-born Latinas specifically included lack of access to health insurance information written in an individual's primary language, 
ineligibility for most insurance plans for those who are undocumented or recently established, fear of deportation if it was found out that an individual does not have insurance, and lack of knowledge about the continued availability of services on a sliding scale at public health clinics, regardless of insurance status, or for that matter, immigration status. So this quote comes from a woman in a focus group in Lawrence who reflected to us how much easier it was for her to access services as a documented immigrant prior to healthcare reform. So she said, before reform, they didn't ask if you were legal or illegal. They didn't ask anything. Now they ask everything. If you're a citizen, you have to show it. Before you didn't, you said, I'm a citizen, and that's it. It's really bad in that aspect. And we heard this many, many times in our Spanish language focus groups about the perceived pressure of revealing your immigration status every time you had a healthcare encounter. One of the agency administrators we spoke to who oversaw a number of clinics with large immigrant populations said, some of our clients are undocumented. When it became mandated for individuals to have health insurance, people were afraid to come to medical facilities because they were under the assumption that if they didn't have health insurance, they would be reported to the authorities. Turning now to look at young people and minors, I won't say much here because I know some of my co-panelists are experts in this area and this project was not focused on young folks. But we do know that about 43% of those who remain uninsured in Massachusetts are young adults aged 18 to 25. Recognizing the challenges that young people face in obtaining and staying on insurance, efforts have been made in Massachusetts to help ensure consistent access to insurance. Um, but we found that since reform, young women and minors have faced some challenges accessing reproductive health care confidentially and also feeling empowered to advocate for themselves when navigating a complex and sometimes bureaucratic health system. So looking specifically at the issue for minors, um, this quote comes from an agency administrator who said, health care reform essentially left out teenagers. Anybody who's under 18 is not eligible for the Commonwealth care plans, so it assumes that those kids are covered under their parents' insurance, but if clients are coming to family planning and they want confidential services, we're not about to bill their parents' insurance. So in this case, the family planning providers end up footing the bill for providing those confidential services to folks who are insured but don't want their parents to find out about the services they get. Now looking at non-urban populations, and again, uh, though we did have some um, non-urban participants in our focus groups, I think there needs to be a lot more work here, but we do have a little bit we can say um, about what's happening for those populations in Massachusetts. So the majority of folks in Massachusetts live in one of a number of urban areas in the state. But previous studies have found that about 7% of populations, 7% of the population lives in areas of the Commonwealth that are medically underserved and face documented healthcare provider shortages. And these underserved areas tend to be outside of the major urban areas. So some of the challenges that non-urban women face are finding a local provider who's accepting new clients and also accessing prescriptions due to the long distances to pharmacies. So thinking about a population that used to access contraception through their family planning provider where they're giving the method on site at their appointment, uh, now these women have to you know, go to the doctor, get the prescription, and then go fill it. So there's just another step involved. The last group I want to talk about are those who are going through churn, and I think this is a really critical issue as we move forward on the national stage. So churn occurs when individuals are only able to maintain their insurance coverage for really short periods of time before they're pushed off their plans. Um, and after individuals are disenrolled, they're then forced to try and quickly re-enroll so they don't go too long without their health insurance. Now this is a recognized problem in Massachusetts um, as evidenced by the fact that in an average month, more than 12,000 individuals are wrongly disen disenrolled from their mass health or Commonwealth care plans despite the fact that many of those folks remain eligible for the health insurance programs that they were on. So why does this happen? Um, disenrollment happens primarily due to administrative issues, uh, not changes in eligibility for the program. You can see from this uh, graph that the biggest issue is that information has not been returned to the plans, verifying that an individual still qualifies for the plan. So the verification system is paper-based, so you're mailed some information to your home asking you to recertify your income or your family size. If you've recently moved, you don't receive the notice for some reason, you can't read the language the notice was sent in, or are unable to return the notice in a timely manner for whatever reason, you'll be kicked off your plan. 
Now, the challenge of churn came up um, quite frequently in our results, as we saw that some of the financial, social, and biological transitions that are common experiences in women's lives made it very difficult to stay on the subsidized in health insurance plans. Things like moving, graduating, pregnancy, changing your hours at work, all affected individuals' ability to stay on health insurance programs, again, even though they remained eligible for them. Uh, we also found that individuals are often unaware of when they've been kicked off the insurance plans until the time that they go to a health care provider for a service or go to pick up a prescription. So when they are most in need of health care services is when they're finding out that they're no longer insured. Additionally, we found that once you've been kicked off, it's really difficult to get back on the plans um, and, that there, and that there's some delay in getting back on. So... This quote comes from a woman in one of our Boston focus groups who was really diligent in trying to get back on the health insurance plan. She had a number um, of co-occurring chronic conditions that she needed to have health insurance to address. And she says, I was just trying to figure out why I got kicked off. I've been calling every day, or my friend's been calling for me every day. I get a different answer every time. I then met with somebody from legal services, so she reaches out for help. And it took an, her an hour and a half on the phone with somebody to figure it out. I think it's confusing for the people who are supposed to tell you what's going on. And this, for me, brings me back to an issue that uh, one of the providers here spoke about earlier, is that as a provider or as a legal services person, not really knowing um, or needing some training on what to tell folks once they come to you. So... The impact of these reform-related challenges on the populations I've just described has been manyfold. First, a number of women delayed seeking care while they were trying to figure out what they were eligible for or waiting for their insurance period to begin. Second, misunderstandings about prescription benefits as well as not being able to stay on an insurance plan caused some women to have decreased or inconsistent access to prescriptions that they filled every month. Uh, we were particularly concerned about the impact of, of this of things like hormonal contraception that needs to be filled every month, but similar concerns arose in our focus groups around other medications that need to be used continuously, such as mental health medications, diabetes medications, asthma medications, you name it, whatever we need continuously. Third, some women just stopped seeking health care altogether, um, both from health care providers at private health clinics, but also from those from public health care providers. This seemed to be particularly true for immigrants who had concerns about what the mandate meant and were afraid of being deported for not complying with the mandate. Finally, having individuals turn on and off the plans only makes financial sense momentarily. In the long run, re-enrolling individuals ends up costing the state uh, quite a bit of money. Now, because the women in our focus groups described really trusting the family planning providers in the Commonwealth, and because of the service delivery model of family planning providers, these providers really played a critical role in Massachusetts in moderating some of the challenges that low-income women faced after reform. One admin agency administrator said, we do our best to buff buffer our clients from any state and federal funding fluctuations. Our agency is absorbing the additional cost. So I'm hoping that our clients have not seen the change at all, because we will take them if they're insured, we'll take them if they're not. So here we see the really critical role that these family planning providers are, play, are playing in Massachusetts. One of the things I didn't talk about was some of the administrative challenges that they've had in working with some of the new health care plans, the training needs uh, they have for some of the frontline staff and working with folks over their plans. So they're seeing a lot of additional cost up front with health care reform. So in sum, health care reform has benefited a huge number of people in Massachusetts. But some populations in the Commonwealth remain either uninsured or unable to access benefits even though they are insured. The populations facing particular challenges include immigrants, young women and minors, non-urban women, those women going through churn. And safety net providers like family planning providers really play critical roles in helping to and helping eligible clients just navigate the insurance system and providing services for those who are not eligible. Um, so this project had a number of limitations. It was a really small study designed to take a quick snapshot at what was happening in healthcare reform in Massachusetts. Um, some of the things we can't talk about, our focus group per participants were primarily at or under 100% of the federal poverty level. They were disproportionately located in the greater Boston area and were urban. 
Uh, we also only spoke to English and Spanish speakers, so we can't speak to the experiences of folks who don't speak either of those languages. Uh, we also recognize that there are multiple factors that inform the provision and access of health care. And we didn't measure health outcomes, so we can't say how those were affected. But because of the consistency of our findings with each other and the consistency of our findings with some of the other work that's been happening in Massachusetts, and because of the similarities of Massachusetts reform and the Affordable Care Act, despite uh, what Mitt Romney says, we believe there are some important lessons to be drawn from these findings. So based on these findings, we believe that the Affordable Care Act holds a promise of increasing access to insurance and services for millions. But the challenges faced by immigrants, young women and minors, non-urban women, and women going through common life transitions in Massachusetts may be magnified on the national stage and particularly in states with less developed public health infrastructures. So you'll remember all the really great things I said we have happening in Massachusetts already, and states without those things. I'm not sure where those populations will turn. Because of these challenges and the demand for safety net providers, because of these challenges, uh, we believe the demand for safety net providers will increase in national health care reform, and therefore proactive efforts are needed to mediate those challenges. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, our next uh, topic um, is titled Impl Implications of Healthcare Reform Legislation for Access to Reproductive Health Services Among Current and Former Foster Youth. Um, and it is going to be presented by Kim Ahrens and Amy Jaworski. Let me just tell you a little bit about um, both, uh, both speakers. Um, Kim Ahrens is an assistant professor in the Division of Adolescent Medicine at Seattle Children's Hospital and the University of Washington School of Medicine. Her clinical and research interests are in promoting positive physical and mental health outcomes for at-risk youth. Um, she uh, currently con is conducting a series of NIH-sponsored research studies focusing on developing an intervention program uh, to reduce risk of sexually transmitted infections, including um, HIV among adolescents in the foster care system. Um, Amy Jaworski uh, is right here um, across the street um, at Chapin Hall. She's a senior researcher there. Her research interests include youth aging out of foster care, homeless youth, pregnant and parenting youth in foster care. Um, Dr. Jaworski is a co-investigator of the Midwest Evaluation of the Adult Functioning for Former Foster Youth and is currently part of a task force charged with addressing the workforce development needs of DCFS wards. So, welcome. So, Kim and I are going to uh, co-present. I'm going to sort of set the stage for the findings that, that Kim's going to present. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the child welfare system, I just want to say a, a bit about foster care. Um, when children come into the foster care system, primarily because they've been neglected and abused, um, the idea is that their stay in foster care will be temporary and that they'll eventually be re returned home to their families when it's safe to do so. In the case of children who cannot be returned home, um, the goal is to um, have these children adopted um, or to place them with legal guardians. Unfortunately, um, every year um, there's about 30,000 young people who uh, age out of the foster care system without a permanent home. So these are young people who family reunification was not a viable option. They were not adopted and, and not placed with a legal guardian. And so this is the population that we're going to be focusing on. Um, the major federal legislation dealing with this population um, is the Chavy Foster Care Independence Act. And this was a piece of legislation that came into being back in 1999. And one of the provisions in this legislation gave states an option to extend uh, Medicaid coverage to young people after they leave the foster care system. It was a state option, um, and uh, although a majority of states have exercised that option, um, there are still states where young people um, lose their Medicaid coverage once they leave the foster care system, typically at age 18. So Kim and I are going to talk uh, primarily about two provisions in the, um, the uh, uh, health care reform legislation. 
um, related to foster, that, that could have an impact on health care coverage for youth aging out of foster care. One is a provision that um, requires states to ex um, extend Medicaid coverage to all former foster youth until their 26th birthday if they were at least 18 years old when they left foster care. And this sort of parallels the uh, provision related to allowing young people in general to stay on their parents' health insurance. Um, there's also another provision that requires states to extend Medicaid coverage to all non-elderly individuals with incomes below 133% of the federal poverty level. So we were interested in what the impact of these two provisions would be on this particular population. Um, predicting what, those, what that impact would be is, is complicated for a couple of reasons. Um, one, states can change their policies. So I, I mentioned this provision in the um, Chafee Foster Care Independence Act related to extending Medicaid. Um, so s some states that currently don't do that could decide to do that. States that currently do do that could um, change their mind and, and go back to not doing that. Um, some percentage of young people aging out of foster care will be covered by private insurance through their employers, through a spouse, through school. We don't know what that percentage is. And then there's also a sizable percentage of these young people who will already be covered by Medicaid, um, particularly low-income parents or pregnant women. So um, we wanted to think about what impact this would have um, in general, and then also on the receipt of reproductive health care services. So we know from prior research that having health insurance is linked in other populations, not in, not in young people aging out of foster care, to the receipt of family planning services and timely prenatal care. And we suspect that increasing Medicaid coverage will increase access to both family planning and to prenatal care. Um, this is really important for this population because we know from other research, including some of the research that we're going to talk about today, that young women in foster care are at very high risk of becoming pregnant soon after aging out, and that many of those pregnancies result in live births. So giving these young people access um, to health insurance so that they can, in turn, have access to family planning services and prenatal care is very important. So the data that we're going to present today come from um, the Midwest study. This is a study, a longitudinal study of young people aging out of foster care in three states, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois. And we've actually um, collected uh, data at five different points in time from these young people. Um, the first time we collected data was back in 2002, 2003, when they were 17 or 18 years old and still in foster care. And we've collected from the data from them about every two years since then. Um, we're just finishing up our fifth wave of data collection. Um, and they're now 25 and 26 years old. The data we're going to talk about today were primarily collected um, at age 19, 21, and 23, 24. And we're going to focus on the experiences of the 377 young women in the study. Now, one of the important things to note about the states in our study is that they have very different policies regarding um, the age at which young people leave the foster care system. And in particular, Illinois has been one of the few states where young people have been able to routinely stay in foster care until they're 21 years old. And this is, this is very um, different from the experience of young people in Wisconsin and Iowa, where young people typically leave care at age 18 and almost never remain in care beyond their 19th birthday. So this sets up a very interesting uh, sort of natural experiment where we have one state that extends foster care to 21 and two states where they don't. Um, just to give you an idea, in Illinois, about three quarters of the young women in our study were still in foster care when they were interviewed at age 19, um, compared to just one young woman from Iowa and none from Wisconsin. So one of the things we're going to talk about is some differences between the young women who were still in foster care and those who were no longer in foster care, as well as some differences between Illinois and the other two states. Um, so what research questions are we going to address? So there's four questions. Uh, one, did health insurance coverage vary depending on whether the young people were, were from a state in which they could stay in foster care till 21? Did receipt of reproductive health care services vary depending on whether young people were from a state where they could stay in care till 21? Did reproduct receipt of reproductive health care services vary depending on whether young people had health insurance? 
And then finally, what impact are those provisions in the Health Care Reform Act likely to have on health insurance coverage? And I'm going to turn it over to, to Kim, who's going to present the results. So with respect to the first question, um, we found that at age 19, there were significant differences between um, uh, insurance, uh, receipt of insurance, when comparing the state of Illinois to uh, Wisconsin and Iowa, um, with uh, young women in the state of Illinois significantly more likely at this age uh, to have received insurance compared to Wisconsin and Iowa. We also found that this difference was uh, completely explained by the difference between young women who, were, who remained in care, who were still in care at age 19, compared to those who were not, not still in care at age 19. Um, and the rate of uh, insurance among those who are no longer in care uh, in Illinois was the same as uh, the rate in Iowa and Wisconsin. However, um, by age 21 and 23 to 24, the majority of young women who had aged out did have health insurance. And of those who were insured, the majority were uh, insured by Medicaid or the S-CHIP program. Um, so turning to the second question, um, looking at the relationship uh, between um, length of stay in care or uh, the age at which uh, young women transitioned out of care, I should say, and the uh, receipt of uh, family planning uh, services or information about birth control, um, we found that there were no between state differences um, between uh, uh, Illinois and Iowa and Wisconsin at either age that we evaluated um, with respect to receipt of family planning. Um, however, when we compared those who are still in care at age 19 to those who are no longer in care in the state of Illinois, we did find a significant difference, thus suggesting that those who were still in care have better access to family planning services. When we looked at the relationship between um, age at which uh, youth emancipated from care and the receipt of uh, prenatal care, um, we found uh, a reverse relationship from what we expected um, and found specifically that, um, uh, that women, young women from Iowa and Wisconsin were more likely to report having received prenatal care at uh, age 19 uh, compared with those from Illinois and uh, comparing those who were still in care at age 19 with those who were no longer in care, um, young women who were no longer in care in Illinois were more likely as well. Um, by ages 21 and 23 to 24, those dis differences had disappeared. However, uh, when we looked at uh, this analysis, excluding young women who had had um, abortions, uh, we found that all of the differences between those who were, between the states and between those who were still in care and out of care had disappeared suggesting that the reason behind this finding is that uh, young women who uh, remain in care are more likely to get an abortion. Uh, uh, so with respect to the third question, um, looking at the relationship uh, between uh, health, uh, health insurance status and the receipt of family planning services or information about birth control, uh, we found that young women who had health insurance were more likely to have received family planning services or information about birth control at age 21. And there was a trend uh, in the same direction at age 19 as well. Um, however, um, we found no differences, uh, both with, with women who had terminations included or excluded in the receipt of prenatal care. We're gonna discuss a little bit later why we think this is the case. Now, uh, turning to the potential impact of the two provisions of the health care reform bill that are relevant to foster youth, um, uh, we want to highlight uh, the fact that we found that um, uh, a large portion of young women were insured by age 21 and age 23 or 24, but there were significant portions that were uninsured at these ages as well, about a third at age 21 and about a quarter at age 23 to 24. Um, we found that uh, the majority, not surprisingly, of those who were uninsured uh, were, had incomes below 133% of the federal po poverty level. And thus, um, based on the income level provision of the health care reform bill, less than uh, 5% at age 21 and 3% at age 23 to 24 um, would be uninsured under that provision, which is very similar to the nearly 100% that would be eligible in this population 
with the Foster Care Specific Act uh, or provision. And I'm saying not, not completely 100% because there are a small portion of youth that emancipate from care under age 19. So I just want to quickly go over some limitations of these data. Um, first, we, um, as I was explained previously, the data came from three Midwestern states. Uh, therefore, we cannot um, completely predict the generalizability of, this, of these results to the rest of the states in this country. Data were collected by self-report, and therefore, um, it's possible that um, some women did receive services uh, that they did not remember. However, generally speaking, even in adolescent young women populations, um, the uh, report of services tends to be accurate. Uh, we were also limited by our sample size, particularly with, re with respect to the questions related to prenatal care. And um, because of the sample sizes, we, did not, we were not able to control for some of the other factors that could be affecting these outcomes. In addition, we had some minor differences in the way some of the questions were asked between waves, so, uh, there, uh, uh, so that provided some potential um, difficulty in terms of being able to uh, look at questions, these, these questions as well. And because this is observational data, we cannot make claims about causal relationships. Um, I just want to close um, by discussing sort of two of these points from our findings and putting them into the context of um, existing literature. Um, first, um, although we found a relationship between insurance and family planning services, which is very similar to previ previous studies, we did not find, as I mentioned, an association between uh, insurance status and access to prenatal care. However, previous research in other populations has demonstrated a firm relationship between pre-pregnancy insurance status and access to timely prenatal care, and we were not able to look at the data in that manner. Um, and so we suspect that's one of the reasons why we did not find that relationship, in addition to the sample size issue. Um, and in addition, um, uh, we also want to acknowledge, as many other people have today, that um, access to family planning services and prenatal care services are both influenced by a variety of other um, factors in, other than insurance. Um, and then finally, um, uh, we want to uh, sort of end by talking about the fact that um, while a, a portion, a, lar a majority of young women had health insurance by their mid-20s, um, uh, there is a portion that remains uncovered. Um, and uh, based on the firm relationship between, that we found in this study and existing studies, uh, the relationship that existing studies have shown between access to family planning services and prenatal care, or insurance and access to those outcomes, that we find that um, these provisions, that are, the benefits from these provisions to this population are likely to significantly outweigh the costs. So I want to end with a plea that um, as we go forward and advocate for reproductive justice um, over the next several years, and um, as some of these provisions may be potentially put on the chopping block, that this population not be forgotten. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is um, Angel Foster. She is also with IBIS, um, um, uh, IBIS Reproductive Health. She joined IBIS in uh, 2002 and is a senior associate there. Um, she leads a program of work dedicated to reproductive health issues in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, so perhaps at the reception afterwards, some people might have some more sort of global health issues and you should find her out. Um, she is going to talk to us today about um, a project that's uh, more close to home uh, where she is in Massachusetts, which, which is on the READY initiative, um, an initiative to prevent unplanned pregnancy and promote sexual health in the wake of healthcare reform in Massachusetts. So another look at kind of how things were happening around Massachusetts reform. Um, just a few other accolades. Uh, Dr. Foster has... Um, uh, received um, the was named one of the Choice USA's 30 under 30 activists for reproductive freedom in um, uh, uh, and in 2009 she received the American Public Health Association uh, Population Sexual and Reproductive Health Sections Outstanding Young Professional Award. So thank you very much and welcome.
Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for sticking around to the bitter end. It's great to be the last speaker on the, on the session because I'm actually going to try to end with some positive ideas of where we might be going with healthcare reform. I am absolutely delighted to be here and I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of both my colleagues at IBIS Reproductive Health and also our collaborators at both the Pro-Choice Massachusetts Foundation and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Family Planning Program. And with this lens, I'm here to present to you some of the work that we've been doing in Massachusetts around young adults, contraception, and healthcare reform. So this afternoon, I'm gonna begin by setting the Commonwealth context. And Amanda did a great job of sort of setting me up, so I'm gonna to try to tag team with her and not be too repetitive. And then I'm going to turn to a project that we've undertaken over the last two and a half years called the Reproductive Empowerment and Decision Making Among Young Adults Initiative or the READY initiative. I'll highlight key findings from two studies that we conducted over the last two years, and then I'll describe some of the work that our statewide task force has been doing, uh, as well as what our next steps are in Massachusetts. Finally, I'll conclude by discussing what our findings and experiences might suggest regarding national healthcare reform and some of the lessons that we can learn from both the results of, of what's happened in Massachusetts, but also some of the advocacy work that we've been doing. Now, the life phase of young adulthood has shifted markedly in recent decades. And these changes in aggregate patterns of education, employment, relationships, and childbearing have significant implications for sexual behaviors and reproductive health. Contraceptive counseling and service provision rank high among age-specific health needs for young adults. And consistent with national statistics, studies with young adults in Massachusetts indicate that contraceptive use is high among women in their 20s. And in, and in 2007, a study was published that showed that about 63% of women in their 20s in Massachusetts had used at least one method of contraception in the previous year, the majority of whom used either oral contraceptive pills or condoms. Now, nationally, women in their 20s account for about a little more than half of all unintended pregnancies. And this is true in Massachusetts as well. So a 2006 survey in Massachusetts, so a survey that was undertaken prior to healthcare reform, found that nearly half of all women aged 18 to 24 had reported having had an unintended pregnancy. There were extremely large disparities based on income in this finding. And so women, uh, young women who were in a household with an annual household income of less, less than $25,000 were much more likely to have experienced an unintended pregnancy than young adult women who were in a household with an annual income of over $75,000. And those percentages were 50% for lower income women and 8% for higher income women. So there continues to be considerable need for comprehensive pregnancy prevention services among young adults. And I should also say that consistent with what we know at the national level, in the Commonwealth, contraception use in general, the consistency and the continuation of use, and method selection have all been associated with both insurance status and the type of health plan that young women are on. Now, I know we've talked a little bit about Massachusetts today, but I wanted to say a couple of big picture things about Chapter 58. So first, it really does represent a groundbreaking effort to increase access to affordable, high-quality health care. Passage of this law in 2006 set in motion a series of reforms that considerably reduced the uninsurance rate. And these reforms included individual and employer mandates, expansion of subsidized care, as well as market reforms. Chapter 58 and the subsequent revisions established the Commonwealth Health Insurance Connector Authority, or the Health Connector. And the Health Connector is an independent state agency that's responsible for implementing various aspects of healthcare reform in the Commonwealth, including the establishment of coverage standards, which are known as the minimum creditable coverage standards. The connector also connects individuals and small businesses with affordable health insurance plans. Now the health connector administers two portable health insurance programs, the subsidized Commonwealth care program that Amanda talked about, as well as the unsubsidized Commonwealth choice program. And the health connector has a website that provides information about health care reform and helps connect residents in Massachusetts with affordable coverage options that are qualified health plans and meet the individual mandate. 
So as we talk about exchanges today, one thing to think about about the connector is this is basically our exchange in Massachusetts. Now, consistent with national trends, young adults in the Commonwealth have historically been disproportionately uninsured. A number of proactive efforts were undertaken to create mechanisms for young adults to obtain or retain affordable insurance. And this was done both for young adults themselves, but also to diversify the risk pool. Chapter 58 reformed the dependency statutes such that young adults became eligible to remain on a parental health plan through the age of 25 or for up to two years after the loss of dependency status through the, for, through the federal tax code. So it was basically up to two years after finishing full-time school. And in Massachusetts, that was whatever came first. This has subsequently been reformed because of what's happened in the national level. There are also two young adult health targeted health programs in the Commonwealth. The first is the student health program, or the SHIP. And this was actually enacted in 1988, and it mandates that students who are enrolled at at least 75% time in institutions of higher learning, they have to participate in a qualified student health insurance plan or provide proof of comparable coverage. The SHIP also requires that institutions of higher learning provide health insurance plans, and they can do that on campus, they can do that externally, or they can do it through a combination. Now, modeled after the SHIP are what are called the Young Adult Plans, or the YAPs, and these developed out of Chapter 58 and are part of that unsubsidized Commonwealth, Care, or Commonwealth Choice Program. Young adults age 18 to 26 with incomes greater than 300% of the federal poverty level and who are not offered uh, an employer-sponsored health benefit are eligible for enrollment in the YAPs. Now, in an effort to reduce costs uh, for these young adult targeted health plans, these two types of plans, both SHIPs and YAPs, have been exempted from providing some of the services that are included in the minimum coverage standards. So the big one that I'll talk about today is that these plans are not required to have a prescription drug benefit. So while all of these qualifying plans in Massachusetts have a prescription drug benefit, these young adult targeted plans have been exempted from that, and they're still qualified health plans in Massachusetts, and an individual who's enrolled in them still meets the individual mandate. Now, I want to be real clear about what our definition of young adults are. In Massachusetts, we define a young adult as 18 to 26 inclusive. So when I'm talking about young adults today, that's the population I'm talking about. And that certainly isn't the same de definition of young adults we use in other areas. So it's this overall context that motivated the creation of the Ready Initiative. In 2008, a coalition of Massachusetts health service providers, advocates, and researchers formed a unique statewide project to reduce unplanned pregnancy among young adults in the wake of healthcare reform in the Commonwealth. The first two years of the initiative focused on better understanding the individual, community, provider, and structural factors that influence contraceptive behaviors of young adults age 18 to 26, and on developing strategies to ensure that this age group has the resources that they need to lead healthy sexual and reproductive lives. This includes making decisions about whether and when to become parents. This project was funded by the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy, and IBIS Reproductive Health undertook formative research which informed actions of a statewide multi-agency task force which was coordinated by Pro-Choice Massachusetts Foundation. The Ready Initiative was guided by a steering committee comprised of about 27 different individuals, organizations, and agencies within the Commonwealth, and the steering committee was chaired, or is chaired, by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Family Planning Program. So today, I'd like to describe sort of the two and a half year history of the Ready Initiative, and I'll focus on the results of our formative research and the ways in which this research has informed state level activities by our task force. In particular, I'll focus on the creation of a digital toolkit, which we call the Little Black Book. And this book aims to provide young adults with information about healthcare reform and contraceptive coverage in the Commonwealth. Now, as part of the formative research, IBIS Reproductive Health uh, conducted two distinct studies. The first is that we conducted a systematic review of health plans targeting young adults in Massachusetts to determine the plan's coverage of contraceptive services and counseling. We reviewed the publicly available material, materials of all 12 of the YAPs, as well as seven of the SHIP programs, and we purposefully selected SHIP programs based on their variation in geographic location, 
size, source of funding, religious affiliation, and two versus four year degree granting programs. Our sample of ships included five private colleges and universities and the blanket programs for both the University of Massachusetts system and the Massachusetts Community College system. In the second study, we conducted 11 focus group discussions with young adults age 18 to 26. 89 young adults participated in these groups, which were held in six of the 14 counties in Massachusetts. We held nine groups with women and two groups with men, and we had one group in Spanish for men and one group in Spanish for women. We held three discussion groups with specific groups of college students to learn more about what was happening through their SHIP programs. I'll say about these 89 participants, they represented age diversity. We got them all through our 18 to 26 year old range, considerable ethnic and racial diversity, and we also had a great deal of diversity with respect to insurance status. So 10% of the young adults were uninsured at the time that they participated in our discussion. Um, and I, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, many more had been uninsured at least temporarily at some point since the passage of healthcare reform. And our participants actually represented the full range of health plans available in the Commonwealth. So we had enrollees in mass health, subsidized Commonwealth care. We had people who were enrolled in private insurance plans, either through an employer or through a parent. And we had enrollees in both CHIPS and YAPS. All right. So what did we find? Well, first, I think it's important to emphasize that young adults were overwhelmingly in favor of health care reform in the Commonwealth. And they cited both public health aims and social justice goals as reasons for why increasing access to health care was important. But for most of our participants, health care reform was defined as the individual mandate. Few young adults were aware of other components of health care reform that had been enacted in Massachusetts in general let alone those reforms that affected young adults. And interestingly, even those young adults who had benefited from some of the reforms under health care reform didn't necessarily make that connection that it was health care reform based. This was consistent with another overwhelming finding, which was that health insurance literacy, regardless of educational level or current student status, was extraordinarily poor. Consistent with many other studies, young adults in our groups uh, expressed considerable min misinformation about contraception, and they generally had a very limited knowledge about the full range of contraceptive methods. This was actually interesting because for many of the young adult women in our groups, contraceptive care was the single most important thing for which they sought health care. Now, <clears throat> we were able to identify a number of types of barriers to contraceptive access. First, which I've already alluded to, is the issue of an informational barrier. Although many young adults are seeking to enroll in a health plan that provides contraceptive coverage, information about coverage is difficult to, to find, and exclusions are often not clear or not stated. I will say that the findings we had from our focus groups were completely consistent with the findings that we did of the review of the plans. Now, <clears throat> The two studies, we were able to identify a number of systems barriers to young adults obtaining a full range of affordable contraceptive services. And perhaps the most fundamental structural barrier invo involves the prescription drug benefit issue. So in Massachusetts, there are a series of contraceptive equity laws that predate Chapter 58. And these require, among other things, that there is parity in contraceptive coverage when prescription drugs are covered or offered through a plan. Unfortunately, although the minimum creditable coverage standards require qualified health plans in general to provide a prescription drug ben benefit and therefore cover all FDA-approved contraceptive drugs and devices, the young adult plans have been exempted from the requirement. And because the young adult targeted plans don't have to provide a, a, a drug, a prescription drug benefit, many of them don't and thus contraception isn't covered. So it's still in parity. It's in compliance with the equity laws in Massachusetts. It's just that no contraception is being covered, no prescription drugs are being covered, so contraception isn't either. Now, other young adults actually reported that when they were on young adult targeted plans, the high copays for prescription drugs effectively made contraception unaffordable. And this high copay issue has been developed with the expectation that young adults are a healthy population, so they don't really need medications that often. So what we really do is we make their premiums less, but then they'll pay more for contraception. And I will say that for a lot of young adults, they don't think about contraception as a prescription drug. And so, what, and, 
even though it is, even though structurally that's how you get access to it, when people are looking at plans and thinking about it, they're not looking at the prescription drug benefit plan and saying the copay for my oral contraceptive pills is going to be $50 a month. Balancing affordability and coverage is definitely a challenge, but I think it's important to realize that contraception fits squarely in this, and we need to think about this for young adult populations. Now, another major structural barrier that we heard about again and again was the lack of confidentiality. Being a dependent on a parental plan or being enrolled in a student health plan where a parent receives the bills places young adults in a tenuous position regarding privacy. Young adults are rightfully concerned that a parent will find out that they're contracepting because of the billing practices of the insurance carrier, not because of what's happening with their interaction with a clinician. And something that probably comes as no surprise to this audience, particularly this morning's, because of this morning's conversation, religious restrictions on contraceptive care poses a significant barrier to access to information, referrals, and service delivery. And this is particularly true for students who are enrolled in religiously affiliated colleges and universities. Finally, I want to mention the issue of transition. So I said that 10% of the young adults in our focus groups were uninsured at the time of the discussion but a, a much larger proportion had been at least temporarily uninsured in the post-Chapter 58 period. Being uninsured was almost always associated with a significant life transition, such as graduating from college, the loss of a job or the start of a new one, moving residence, or a birthday. And in almost every case, being uninsured was involuntary. So this narrative that gets created about young adults not wanting to be insured was not something that we saw at all in our work in Massachusetts. It really was involuntary periods of being uninsured. Although it appeared that some of the young adults in our study were actually eligible for insurance, they could have potentially stayed on a parental plan, they could have enrolled in a YAP, Young adults didn't know that these mechanisms were there and thus couldn't avail themselves of them. Now, for a number of the subpopulations in our study, we were able to identify very specific barriers to a consistent, to consistent access to a full range of contraceptive care. The transitional issues had a profound impact on young adults' ability to consistently contracept. And we heard many reports of women who were moving from either effective prescription to non-prescription contraception or to no contraception at all because they went uninsured and they were no longer able to get prescription drugs. Enrollees in subsidized plans, and this is certainly consistent with what Amanda talked about earlier, they generally reported feeling positive about the kind of contraceptive coverage that they were able to receive, but only if they were able to find a provider in that area of the state that accepted their plan. Further, many of the women on subsidized plans reported being dropped from plans because there had been a filing problem or information hadn't been communicated. And women also described experiences of actually coming to a pharmacy with a prescription in hand only to be told that their copay had changed or some other structural issue had happened, and so they would leave empty-handed and invariably not use prescription contraception that month. The privacy, religious restrictions, and transition issues were all especially impactful for college and university students. And what I will say is that many of the college and university students in our study were effectively underinsured with respect to contraception. And part of this is because they are eligible for student health insurance, they are not eligible for some of the other mechanisms available in Massachusetts. And so you may be at a religious university that prevents you from getting contraception, but because you're at a university and have a ship, you can't enroll in a subsidized care plan, even though you would otherwise be eligible. Finally, I just want to say that the men in our focus groups really felt left out of the conversation around contraception, and frankly, the conversation around healthcare reform in general. All right, so given these findings, what did we do? Based on the findings from the formative research, the Ready Initiative Task Force sort of developed two arms. The first one is dedicated to creating young adult-friendly informational resources, and the other one was dedicated to policy reform. Now, given the informational barriers that exist among young adults and the staggering gap in informational, uh, informational resources that target young adults, and I have to say, having spent a lot of time on the Connector website, some of this material is absolutely unpenetrable. Um, the Ready Task Force set out to address this gap 
And what we wanted to do was create a resource that would help young adults navigate the health system in the Commonwealth, that would provide young adults with information about contraception coverage, contraceptive coverage in different health plans, and that we would be able to direct young adults to alternatives when contraceptive coverage was not a part of a plan. So in December of 2010, we launched uh, the English version of My Little Black Book for Sexual Health, a guide for getting the health insurance you need to prevent pregnancy until you're ready. From now on, I'm just going to call it the Little Black Book. This multimodal resource provides young adult friendly information about health insurance, contraception, and the coverage of contraception in other sexual and reproductive health services. The process of creating the resource included significant engagement with young adults. So first and foremost, young adults were part of our task force, both as individuals and also as representatives from different agencies. And so they were integrally involved with drafting the content and were a part of all of the sort of top level decision making about the resource. Second, we engaged young adults in, uh, in conducting a formal review of the content and we adapted both the information and the language, the language sort of level that we used based on those findings. And finally, we actually concept tested this resource and we had a, a number of different designs and models that had been developed by a local graphic design firm called Argus. And about 100 young adult concept testers participated in this evaluation. And I will say they overwhelmingly preferred the LBB. And part of it was the sort of funky play on words in terms of what a little black book signals. Some of it also was the fact that you actually read it like a book and it's something that's actually quite comfortable. We developed a Spanish language version of the resource and conducted a separate review for the development of that resource and it went live January of 2011. Now in the first three months that both books were launched, um, the resource was visited about 3,000 times by 1,600 unique, view, unique visitors. About a third of all of the visitors to the resource are actually coming from Massachusetts, from ISP addresses in Massachusetts, mostly Boston, but we're starting to see a trickle in other areas of the state. And about 20% of the Massachusetts visitors or people who are accessing the resource are downloading the PDF version, which for us is a really good sign that people are seeing it as something that they're going to use more than once. We've gotten the word out about the book by integrating it into various partnering agency website and materials. Providers are starting to use the book in Massachusetts to talk with their young adult clients. We also did a YouTube video, and we have a postcard campaign that's going to correspond with the upcoming college graduation se season. And I will say that while, most of, while a lot of the material in this book is Massachusetts specific, the kinds of questions that we encourage young adults to ask and the approach that we encourage young adults to take in order to think through their health insurance options are things that could be valuable for people who are in other states. I will say that there's still some additional work that we need to do with this. Um, we had a team of people from the Harvard School of Public Health who conducted a literacy assessment of the resource, and we still have some language level changes that we need to make so it's more user friendly. They also did a usability assessment of the resource, and so we'll be making some structural changes to increase the navigability of the, of the resource. And finally, we had originally envisioned this as being the first of a series of materials. So we wanted a little black book on abortion care, a little black book on prenatal, maternal, and postpartum care, a little black book on violence, and a little black book on STI and HIV care. And we actually haven't been able to get the funding to be able to develop these other resources. So now we're going back and taking this primary book and seeing if we can integrate more of the other sexual and reproductive health care information into it. Now our task force has also taken on a series of policy initiatives or policy priorities. The ones that I want to highlight first is that we need to address this gap in the YAPS issue. This idea that some of these young adult targeted plans are exempt from a prescription drug benefit is really a problem. And so that's something that we've been working with uh, a number of different stakeholders in changing. Because the ships were grandfathered into healthcare reform, there actually are gaps within that system and there have been some conversations within the Commonwealth about how to reconcile and that's an activity that we're actively a part of. We've also been working with student, uh, student organizers and activists to help train them in healthcare reform parlance and advocacy. We need to take on the issue of protecting young adult privacy. Um, we need to get systems in place so that when young adults continue on a parental plan, uh, the goals of transparency don't undermine confidentiality. And we have some really nice models for how that can be done through teen services. 
And finally, and this is a tough nut to crack, but we really need to address the religious restriction issues. Part of what needs to happen in Massachusetts is that exclusions to services need to be disclosed. It needs to be clear, and information and referrals need to be something that is mandated. And that's something that we're working on in a number of different ways. Finally, one of the areas that our task force has taken on is this issue of reconciliation. And we don't really know how ACA is going to affect what's happening in Massachusetts in a whole bunch of different ways. And so we're looking to what's happening as ACA sort of rolls out and how we reconcile what's happening in Massachusetts with what the requirements are on the national level. I will say that the policy priorities that we've taken on have required very different approaches. And this has been a learning experience for all of us. Some of these are statutory issues. Some of these are issues that are legislative. Some of these are issues that are in the purview of the connector and the connector alone. And so for each of the kinds of things that we want to see change in the Commonwealth, we've really had to dissect who are the stakeholders and how do we find the different leverage points to affect change. We've also really tried to take advantage of windows of opportunity when there are moments when we might be able to kind of get something in there and shake it up and change things around. That's certainly been the case with the college health plans. So what are some of the lessons from, from Massachusetts? I think the first is that we need to continue to be really vigilant. Contraception is a critically important component of women's health and of preventive services, and we can't let this issue slip through the, the cracks. I think this has come up in a number of ways today, but I think it's also important to remind ourselves that we need to continually emphasize that healthcare reform is much more than the individual mandate. We've seen that as a challenge in Massachusetts and with the lawsuits that we're seeing on the national level, we need to constantly remind ourselves and our communities that there are many benefits around healthcare reform and many aspects of healthcare reform that aren't about the individual mandate at all. When we think about national health care reform, I think it's important that we keep young adults on the table. And we need to remember that these changes in dependency statutes, which have already gone into effect and are really important, they also have implications for privacy. And so we need to think at the state level and as we think about this nationally, one of the ways that we protect uh, young adult privacy and how do we engage with parental decision makers and insurance carriers to make sure that that happens. We've learned in Massachusetts that healthcare reform has the potential to erect new and unintended barriers to contraceptive services. We need to react quickly if and when these challenges arise. But I will say that these structural and systems barriers are much harder to address once they're in place. So as healthcare reform starts to roll out in different states, we really need to make sure that young adult targeted plans or grandfathered plans or these kinds of things include prescription drug benefits, actually are on par with what moves forward in terms of the requirements at the state and national levels, and we need to fight for the inclusion of contraception and sexual and reproductive health services. I think another lesson that we've learned in Massachusetts um, is that we need to, from the get-go, start to systematically collect information about what's happening with young adults. It's something that we, hadn't, we didn't do in Massachusetts after healthcare reform rolled out. And this is a population with age-specific health needs and that is also, uh, also has different mechanisms for meeting the individual mandate and different kinds of plans. And yet we don't collect routine or systematic data on this, uh, on this age cohort. And that's something that we can change as we start thinking about uh, healthcare reform in other states and at the national level. And finally, one thing that I want to mention is how important it is as these exchanges roll out to connect with your connector. What we've seen in Massachusetts is one of the most critical relationships that we have been able to build are with people who are effectively on these exchanges. If as exchanges are being developed in different states, you can figure out ways to get involved with that process, whether that's through public hearings or actually finding people to be a part, integral part of those exchanges. Having allies on the exchange from the get-go can really influence the way healthcare reform is implemented. Now, I wanted to conclude by trying to, to be a little bit of a voice of optimism. And I want to take us back to the fact that Chapter 58 represents, really, an amazing achievement at increasing access to affordable, high-quality health care, including sexual and reproductive health services. Young adults are among those that have been proactively incorporated into health care reform in Massachusetts, and they have, in general, benefited from health care reform. There are, no doubt, some gaps in this system. 
But I think it's really important that we look at overall the kinds of benefits and take the positive and work with that. I think it's also important to realize that Massachusetts has a very long-standing history of supporting sexual and reproductive health and has enacted a number of progressive policies, many of which happened well prior to health care reform. In some ways, we're lucky in Massachusetts that this is the baseline that we started from, and I know that's going to be a different challenge in other states. But our, but our experience in Massachusetts suggests that many of the gaps and barriers that are created were unintended. And in fact, our conversations at the policy level around these kinds of, around these kinds of issues, around contraceptive coverage, you can't find someone who is sitting there and is an advocate for not providing young adults with access to contraception. These are unintended consequences that came when balancing a whole bunch of different things around health care reform. So I think one of the really important lessons here is that through partnerships and advocacy efforts, we can address these gaps, particularly if we can find the right leverage points. And I actually think that right now, despite all of the challenges that lie ahead, this has the potential to be a really exciting time, a really exciting time for us in our individual states and a really exciting time on the federal level. I know that this has been challenging in Massachusetts, but it's also been really exciting to try to work with a system that has been developed and try to find ways to improve that. Is it perfect? Of course not. Are there things that now we look back at and we wish had been different? Of course that's the case. But we have this real opportunity to expand a full range of health, uh, health services uh, within the state of Massachusetts, and it's been a really exciting process to engage with that. So with that, thank you. Hi. Uh, quick question, and then maybe if there's time, a comment. Um, has Massachusetts looked at um, consumers' access to the information they need? So my concern is about sort of what's typically called the digital divide, and if so much of this information is through the internet, I just heard a story this morning about public libraries closing down, et cetera. You know, in general, of course, younger people are more electronically literate, but these um, services are supposed to be available to everybody, and if people can't get online, can't get online in a private setting, have the, I guess what's nationally called the navigators, served a useful role? I'm curious if that's something you guys looked into in Massachusetts. Yeah, I mean, I think we can probably both comment on this. I will say that, you know, online resources, resources provided by the connector, uh, printed materials from different, it, different plans are only one part of the way that information is communicated. And that's certainly been a big part. But there's actually um, been a real increase in trying to have dedicated phone numbers so that people can call and actually work with individuals to talk them through plans. And there was a lot of funding that was initially provided to help community organizations, advocacy groups, and providers enroll people appropriately in plans and be able to work with people on an individual basis. Now, that doesn't mean the system is perfect and there are certainly gaps. Uh, but, there, but there has been this effort to do this in kind of a multimodal, differential access way. And I think that in some, it's certainly in some experiences that we heard from young adults, because young adults are so much more likely potentially to use the internet, that's where they've gone first, and maybe not as likely to avail themselves of the phone numbers, and those who really did, who called and followed up, actually reported some quite positive experiences in being able to get a person who was informed and who could walk them through it in a way that they couldn't find with the online materials. That's great. I'll just add, um, for the low-income folks, the phone service was an issue in that if they didn't have phone minutes to stay on the phone with the connector for half an hour and sort through the different issues. Um, that was a big challenge. So as Angel was saying, a lot of the folks that we spoke to went to their provider and said, tell me what I should do and, and help me figure it out. And um, for the most part, the family planning providers in Massachusetts were able to do that for a lot of the folks. And we'll say there's still a lot more room for engagement with providers and frontline workers around how to help people sift through um, the various aspects of healthcare reform. I think that we, we've seen this around the young adult plans where, again, people just aren't thinking about what happens with this prescription drug benefit issue. And so you've got a provider who's talking through, here are the different options, but not thinking about what the implications are for continuation of a hormonal contraceptive, for example. So I think that what, there's a lot of different points where we can increase education for providers, frontline workers, and, in, and improve services through the connector. Um, 
but it's been and it's been an interesting thing to identify different kinds of challenges than what were maybe expected coming out. for the little black book to say that I used that with my mom to, <laughs> to sort through insurance after I graduated. It was really helpful. So I, I still maintain my Massachusetts residency, so thank you. It was this very is cool to see right? that. Personally, I find it very interesting that um, now that a lot of young adults are covered on their parents' insurance, this idea that their, their personal sexual behaviors are then printed on something that their parents then see, I see a lot of my friends struggle with that now. And I am curious about the specifics if advocacy is occurring to, to try to figure out ways that that information doesn't have to be presented to parents, that beca maybe because they're over 18 that they get a separate bill or something like that. I'm just interested in the progress with that. Thank you. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's a great it's a great question because it, it is really challenging. So typically, it's through the statement of benefits where this information is communicated to a, a parent, and it's because the parent is the holder of the insurance plan or receives the bill for his or her college for her, his or her college student that they get this sort of benefit statement. And the benefit statement, depending on your insurance company, can be quite detailed mm -hmm. and actually list very specific things or it can be broad. And so one issue that we've sort of been talking about, and again, some of this has been modeled for work that's been done with teens around privacy, are, are, are there ways to sort of create these broader categories so that it won't be nearly as clear that the 20-year-old who's enrolled in the parental plan went to a facility and got an IUD insertion? I do think, though, that there, even with broader buckets, there can be some challenges around that. So if on your statement of benefits it says that you got a prescription drug, right, that that's something that's written, you got a service and you got a prescription out of it, and your parent gets that bill, it may be that the question that comes up is, what medication are you taking and what prescription did you get? So I think even with broader buckets, we need to be careful. Um, but there is some work, and in Massachusetts right now, really looking at what's happened through the teen services and trying to figure out ways that we can work with carriers to create some similar kinds of practices. At the university, at the college and university level, that can become much more challenging because when you're talking about on-campus services, you can have basically as many different rules and regulations for how benefit statements are given to a parent as you do colleges and universities. And so that's going to take some other kinds of action. A couple of comments, actually. One, just to follow up on that last question. Um, there is also some work being done at the national level, of course, on this issue. It's a, a very big deal with, with, uh, with the, the dependent coverage provision. Um, and also just with you know, broader expansions of, of you know, children's health insurance over the last number of years. Um, and a, a bunch of the big national provider groups have been um, talking to the federal government to try to see if there are ways around this. <laughs> Um, one possibility um, is that since the reason that the policyholder needs to get this explanation of benefits is for financial accountability, to make sure there is no fraud going on, um, that's one of the justifications for it. There has been some talk about um, for uh, services where there is no financial, um, you know, when, when there's no cost sharing, no, none of that, um, that they might be able to be excluded from the explanation of benefits forms entirely. Um, they're working on it, trying to figure out whether they can fit it within the framework of HIPAA um, you know, and, and other federal laws, and we'll see what happens. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was in terms of the young adult plans. Um, I think that is definitely one area where the, the federal health reform bill differs quite a bit from the Massachusetts one. Um, as I understand it, and someone can jump in if they think I'm getting it wrong, but the, there, there are catastrophic plans being envisioned under the exchanges. Um, but there are two things about them. Um, you know, those are for young adults, but um, one is that they are still subject to all the benefit requirements of the essential benefit package and also to things like the preventive services mandate. Um, they're going to differ essentially in terms of premiums and cost sharing and deductibles, not in terms of the, the scope of the plan. Um, and the second thing is, as I understand it, I think they're only available for people who are unsubsidized or they're not available with a subsidy at least. 
So, um, and since that's only going to be a very small percentage of, of the people on the exchanges, they're probably not going to be a very big part of the exchanges. Um, so hopefully that'll be one thing which will not be an issue. Prescription drugs are one of the 10 items listed specifically on the essential health benefits package. Um, so we're not going to have that issue of, of drugs not being covered at all. Um, and hopefully, keep our fingers crossed, we'll have contraception listed out very specifically, both as part of the essential benefits package and hopefully as part of the, the preventive services package as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your point about the young adult plans and catastrophic coverage is a good one, that this is going to take, this is going to shake out quite differently in different, in different places. Um, one thing that I will say about the experience in Massachusetts is that once we sort of identified this prescription drug benefit issue as being a challenge, there was some discussion about whether or not to try to move forward with the promotion of a young adult formulary. So the idea that you could be in a plan that didn't have a prescription drug benefit overall, but that there would be a certain set of medications asthma, diabetes, antibiotics, contraceptives that would be a part of all young adult plans as a specific formulary. And this is an issue where uh, you had mentioned this earlier today, sort of be careful what you ask for in terms of your short term versus the long term. We really did think about that strategy and decided that actually what was more effective and what we needed to really work for and lobby for was sort of the long term goal of making sure that we have comprehensive coverage um, in terms of a prescription drug benefit package, even though there might be a short term gain in coming up with a young adult formulary. And so it was an, it, it was an interesting strategy conversation that was going on. Um, and we ultimately decided to advocate for the full nugget. Um, just two thoughts. One, but thank you. This is really very, very interesting and um, provocative. I wrote down lots of questions. Um, but so one comment I had is Kaiser Permanente, I don't know if it's national, but I know in California, has developed a system where uh, young adults can, ask, can give an alternate address to, and sort of that way it complies with HIPAA because the plan is sending out the EOB, but the, it's not going to the house. So that's another thing to think about. But um, I really wanted to ask Kim and Amy, no, Amanda, I'm sorry, about the churning. Um, and because we think this is, you know, we talked earlier about the transition, you know, people whose income fluctuates or women become pregnant or a whole bunch of reasons uh, in addition to the ones you identified of people just absolutely falling out off because they can't comply. And I'm wondering if you, um, if any recommendations came out of those findings of this 12,000 people falling off every month. Yeah, I mean, there were a couple of recommendations from our work and Angel probably has some other recommendations from her work. And uh, one of the ones I'll mention is that the, the need to recertify uh, individuals um, or the number of times a plan is going to recertify an individual in a given year is determined by the state um, and I'm not sure how to phrase this sometimes it's a it's a budget question that they continually try to recertify individuals to get folks off the plans um, and so I think one of the strategies we need to think about is um, putting some protections in place around the number of times that folks are re need to be recertified in a given year uh, a second thing I'll mention is really around the language issue, the, the languages that forms are sent to individuals, um, uh, really making sure that those forms are sent to individuals in the prim their primary language and not um, as a default in English. Um, and the third thing is right now the recertification forms are paper-based, um, and we've talked a lot with the connector about having multiple, for, multiple ways to connect with people over the phone or over email or multiple addresses to make sure that um, they don't just go to one address that that person may no longer live at and, and kind of sit there. And, and some of those things are, are still in process and still things we're trying to work with them on. Did you guys have other? No, that's good. Okay. Uh, I have a question since um, nobody else is coming up just yet. Um, I was curious about the religious restrictions and you had mentioned um, that you're just starting to do some work on that in Massachusetts around um, uh, full disclosure of restrictions and then also working with them on um, mandating um, that they would also give information around referrals. Um, can you just talk about that a little bit more? Sure. I mean, there's actually, there, there's been longstanding work around relig religious restrictions in Massachusetts, but I think there's some work that's really been generated through healthcare reform around thinking through what it's going to mean. Um, is this a moment to try to 
increase protections um, in terms of the disclosure requirements. And actually packaging that is beyond religious restrictions, that if you deviate from the minimum credible coverage standards at all, whether that's because you're a religious providing facility or because you have some other change, that you should have to disclose and figure out ways for people to get alternatives. So that's, it's been a moment to try to work with that. I will say that in Massachusetts we had a very fa we had a fascinating case that happened about two years ago where a Catholic health network wanted to uh, put in a bid to become a part of our subsidized Commonwealth care plan. And because Commonwealth care, because subsidized plans in Massachusetts, including MassHealth or our Medicaid program, uh, they, they must cover abortion care. This became a point of tension about whether or not this Catholic affiliated health unit could actually be a part of the Commonwealth care system and ultimately was determined that it could not. Um, there was an attempt to try to partner with a non-religious institution. There was a lot of work that was done. Uh, Pro-Choice Massachusetts Foundation or, or NARAL Pro-Choice Massachusetts did a lot of work and advocacy around that in saying that we can't go in this direction of having religious restrictions of this kind be a part of our subsidized or our unsubsidized exchange programs. Um, sorry, since nobody else is asking questions, I'll just ask more. Um, Amy and Kim, um, I learned a lot from your presentation, and I was just wondering if you could help me and maybe others who don't know as much about the foster care system understand. There seem to be big differences in Illinois between the young people who stayed in foster care and those who didn't. Can you tell us a little bit about that decision. Um, why do pe some people stay in and some people don't? Is that decision made by the young person by themselves, or are they getting lots of advice or you know, influenced by others? How, why why would those uh, outcome differences be likely to be seen? So there's there's several reasons why some young people in Illinois choose not to stay in care while others choose to stay. Um, there's big geographic differences. Um, in particular, here in Cook County, the public guardian's office does a great job of getting young people to stay in care. Um, they really encourage their clients to stay in care. They are very proactive about filing um, paperwork that needs to be done. Um, that's not so true in the rest of the state. So we see big geographic differences. If you look at the percentage of young people who remain in care, it's over 85% here in Cook County. Um, some areas um, downstate, it's you know 40, 50 percent. So that's that's part of what's going on. Um, another factor is the availability of services. So uh, again, this is a, generally a, a Cook County versus rest of the state difference. You know, there's a lot of services here in Cook County for young people that 18 to 21 year old um, range. Not so true in other parts of the state. So a lot of young people in other parts of the state say, you know, what's the point? There's not much here for me that the foster care system is going to offer me. Why stay in care? And then finally, there's also a, a different culture in, in some of the other counties in the state um, where it's just expected that young people, when they turn 18, they're adults and they should you know, go out on their own. Um, and that's, again, not the case here in Cook County. So we see these, you know, these big geographic differences. That's, that's a lot of what you're seeing in the data. I just want to come back to the uh, religious exemption for a moment. It does strike me that this is where the word Massachusetts becomes really key. I mean, in, in most states, if you imagined NARAL versus Catholic providers, that has a yes. sort of Bambi versus Godzilla dimension <laughs> to the sort of politics that, and, and also because a lot of these Catholic providers are actually part of the coalition that you need for other progressive goals connected to health reform. So, so how would, I'm just, this is a question for, for anybody on the panel. I mean, how, would, how should one deal with these issues in a political environment that's just like the 49 other states uh, in the United <laughs> States where the balance of force is just a lot different from uh, Massachusetts? This is one of those moments where, where I can be very happy to be in Massachusetts in terms of the dynamics. Um, you know, I, and, I, and I think it, I'd actually be really interested to hear from other people who have worked in, um, in the context of religious restrictions in other state environments. But I do think that this issue of disclosure can be a real pressing point. 
And this might be one as we roll out on the state levels. And it's not, again, not just about religious entities, although we know that the exclusions are, there, there's many exclusions that are coming from those entities. Um, but that this might be something that we really need to focus on. And that is perhaps a little bit of a lower hanging fruit than actually trying to get coverage or obviously have someone not be able to participate in one of the exchange. But if we could at least get to disclosure requirements and then start to work toward sort of referrals, I think that would be a huge step, particularly in more politically challenging environments. But I don't know. Do you want to say? Do you <laughs> Um, yeah, it's funny, we have, of the people that have worked on religious restrictions, we have California, Massachusetts, and Illinois, right. and Illinois is, is really by far the, the worst of that world. I was actually looking at Lori and, um, and Leah from the ACLU of Illinois, who have recently been lobbying for, um, God forbid, comprehensive sexual health education, and being stymied at every chance that um, they take by the very um, effective Catholic lobby in Illinois. So I don't know if you guys want to jump in about that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lori Chayton. I'm the director of the Reproductive Rights Project for the ACLU of Illinois. Um, we arguably have the worst um, health care refusal law in the country here in Illinois. It was passed while I was in high school. Um, which was a really long time ago, and it is draconian by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and what I wanted to say is I love, I actually was listening very carefully to that and thinking about what, what does this look like here in Illinois. And I think that the disclosure idea, the idea that you just say, that you require people to say, yeah, we're not going to actually conform to, you know, this is the picture we want to see under healthcare reform, and yeah, we're not going to conform to it. Um, we will get pounced on about that. And I think the idea of, refu of referrals just is a no-go from, from um, the first step. And we've seen that, for example, as we've tried to um, pass and then defend a series of regulations that deal with pharmacy refusals. So it's a huge challenge here, but I love the creative thinking you're doing, and I do like, the, I, I really like, I think we need to be playing with the idea of notice of services provided in a careful way. We don't want to have, you know, forced speech. <laughs> um, we are, the, we're the ACLU, so we, right, you know, right, we no, look no, at those totally kinds agree. of things. <laughs> um, but, but I think, you know, where a provider isn't conforming with what is set up for them to conform to um, may very well work nicely. So there you have it. But Illinois is clearly not Massachusetts, even though we, we both have very strong Catholic churches, but... Yeah. Yep. I'll, I'll say another area that we've been exploring and haven't necessarily gotten a lot of traction on, but is this issue of what happens with college students who are effectively underinsured for a particular service. And so one of the things that we've been looking at are what are the mechanisms to try to top up that insurance coverage if you're in a religiously restrictive institution and you're no longer eligible for these other mechanisms because you have your student health program. And is it possible to expand coverage through family planning programs and through the Department of, uh, uh, the Department of Public Health programs for, that particular, for the, those individuals for that limited purpose? And it's something that we've been looking at. It's a, that is hard to do, but it is certainly worth exploring what it would mean to try to have stop this coverage for the underinsured, let's put it that way. And in Massachusetts, that's largely because they're underinsured uh, because they're in a religiously restrictive setting. There's a lot of, there's a lot to be learned from the Medicaid program generally, not yeah. only in terms of the spa, where um, you can have private insurance and get Medicaid in certain circumstances based on this underinsurance concept. So it seems to me that, you know, this is really something we want to be developing in terms of health care reform. Um, uh, but to the larger question of advocacy, um, I think it's really important to be engaging the provider community. So um, with all the, you know, not Massachusetts and not California and not even New York, but in Arizona, um, New Mexico rather, um, a religious hospital was trying to take over community hospital and that merger was actually defeated by community pressure where the providers came together with the community advocates and non-reproductive health, health advocates. 
um, because they said that you know this loss of services was going to be very harmful for the community. So we, we do have more pockets than just states we think of as being blue where um, strong coalitions have come together. I think what's more challenging in coalition work is when you have, uh, for example, you have the Catholic Church coming out very strongly in terms of support of immigrants. And so, and then you have, um, you have you know, organizations like you know, Sojourners who are progressive on lots of issues but not on sexual orientation, gender identity, and not on reproductive health. And so navigating how this coalitions work, um, I think, is very challenging. Um, and I think that you know, we, um, we also do it in a way that we are not disrespectful to religion, but recognizing the corporate systems that are religiously affiliated that are having an impact on services, not people's religious beliefs. And then I, like, I don't like the, the First Amendment quite as much as the ACLU does. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't have a problem with disclosure. But I think disclosure is inadequate if we're not a dealing. And, and so I, I guess I push back a little bit on that, only because um, disclosure seems like a low-hanging fruit. But if it's disclosure without access somewhere else, then big deal. They put up a big sign and say, sorry, you can't get that here. And we haven't really solved the problem for the young men and women who need the services. Just one thing to add on that is something to throw out, and this is certainly my, my personal opinion and not necessarily based on the work that we've done through Ready. But I, but I do think with disclosure and when we look at religious restrictions, I think one of the other concerns to one of the other things we need to be really concerned about is establishing sort of hierarchies of deservedness for information and disclosure. The idea that some women, for example, if you're sexually assaulted and you present at an emergency room, you get information about emergency contraception, but women who present at an emergency room after having had other kinds of, of experiences don't, aren't entitled to that same information. And, I, and I'll just throw that out there as something that we need to think about with religious restriction issues. This is, again, and, and we can disagree on the disclosure, but broad buckets that are about disclosure and its disclosure of exclusions, that it, that's true for everyone, that everyone gets the information about what, what's excluded. And you get that information regardless of whether there are religious restrictions or other kind of restrictions. There's something that's, there, there's some parity in that that I think does start to get away from this problem, this tension that I've found for a long time, which is that often certain women um, are are able to get information, but other women might, may, may not be. My question is with the, you know, the temporary uh, insurance designed for the young, uh, or isn't it more expensive for them to pay for a pregnancy than to pay for contraception? And is it really cost effective for them to not, you know, I mean, to not cover? Because obviously, uh, pregnancy is a huge expense for insurance among women in their 20s. Sure. So I think, you know, so what's happened with these young adult plans in Massachusetts and they're, you know, the part of this unsubsidized Commonwealth um, Choice Program is that there's basically two versions of each one of the YAPs. There's a prescription drug benefit YAP and a parallel non-prescription drug benefit YAP. The prescription drug benefit YAP is more expensive. Um, that's hardly surprising. Um, you pay higher monthly premiums for, for enrollment in that um, in comparison to the non-prescription drug benefit. And in some ways, I think this was created with the idea that if you were a healthy young adult and you didn't really have prescription drug needs, and particularly if you were a young man, we need to offer an alternative so that you can meet the individual mandate, have some degree of coverage, but we want to make it as affordable for you as possible. And so these plans are actually quite inexpensive. Again, I think part of the challenge is the way that people think about contraception. And, and I think that there are a lot of people who don't think about prescription think about contraception or getting an IUD is something that would be covered through a prescription drug benefit. And it's only after you've enrolled in the cheaper plan that you realize now, you know, I may have been saving $35 a month on the premium difference, but now I have $50 or $55 a month in out-of-pocket expenses to get my oral contraceptive pill pack each month. And then it can be harder to actually switch plans and do all of these kinds of things. And so I think you're, I mean, I, I mean the short answer to your question is absolutely. Of course, like, coverage of contraception for someone who does not want to be pregnant and preventing that pregnancy is, uh, is cost-effective. I think what's happened with these plans is not only that, uh, that some have been exempted from prescription drug benefit, but that people don't know exactly what that means. Because what they see themselves is, is taking oral contraceptive pills or getting a depo shot. They don't see themselves as taking 
a medication that, pres that, that they frame as a prescription drug that would be part of a prescription drug benefit. I, I want to add one thing to that as far as the cost effectiveness of family planning. We had a conversation with some of the insurance plans in Massachusetts about covering multiple months of con contraception at once. Um, because that would be more cost effective than a pregnancy. And they said, basically, that sounds like a great idea, but we're interested in the finances in the short term. So um, we don't want to pay for multiple months of contraception right now, because uh, we don't know if when that woman gets pregnant and has a child, if she will still be our client because of all the fluctuations that occur. So it really, uh, just to underscore, again, we see the same kind of short-term financial thinking from the insurance companies. And I think our job is to get them thinking about uh, cost effectiveness in the long run, because we kind of lose one of our most effective arguments um, in that place. Just to um, tack on to that, I mean, I do think that's a fundamental problem in the, the way we've structured the system, right? Because we we want plans to compete a, a, among one another um, to, I, I, I mean, in theory, we want them to compete on all the right dimensions, right? We want them to compete to provide high quality, um, adequate access at low cost, um, and not compete on uh, the bad dimensions, like not providing preventative care. But of course, many times they are competing on those bad dimensions. So I just think, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a challenge because that's built to say, don't, you know, don't think about the financial short term. We're asking insurance companies to act in ways that, that don't make any sense to them as a plan, right? So, so it's, it's a challenge to, to try to, from a public policy perspective, to think about how to structure it, um, how to address that given this structure that we've created. Um, and it, 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 kind of back to the paper with Debbie, but I think this full, full disclosure, I mean, the only way to get plants to be accountable is, to, is for consumers in the state to hold them accountable. And so I think the advocacy, rather than talking to plants and saying, you change your behavior, I just, I'm not very confident about that because unless they're mandated to change or unless consumers say, we're not interested, there's absolutely no reason for them to change. And it's not because they're the boogeyman, it's because it's a business, right? And so I, I just think if we're gonna focus our efforts, um, that's where it should be on the consumers, like, as you've been doing, um, you know, and the state. Any other questions? I think Melissa might come up and uh, Say some closing words, maybe, or should we just it takes a second? <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. It's always hard to be the afternoon, and it was fabulous and really riveting. So I really appreciate it. Um, so thank you all so much to the audience. It's um, uh, it's quite a long day, and eventually it gets warm, and so we're really appreciative of um, all of the time and uh, rapt attention. Um, I wanted to thank Lee Hasselbacker, who um, really just was key in bringing <laughs> um, was really key in um, bringing all of the speakers in today. Um, our policy program is made possible by the Harris Foundation, and so we're always really grateful um, to the Irving B. Harris Foundation for the work that we're allowed to do. And then I also want to thank um, Sarah Orzali, who is in the back, and um, uh, you know, and Sarah truly makes almost everything we do in the section um, possible. But um, was certainly. Uh, key in uh, today's activities. Um, in this section, we combine uh, research and clinical care and policy and education. And so it's always exciting to have a group of speakers here who really help us explore that intersection between um, these many facets that we try to explore, but to really see it at um, the national level and other people's um, instances of it. So again, I'm really appreciative to all of the speakers and their ability to spend so much time with us and, and um, to the audience as well. We have food in the back, I believe drinks, oh, drinks over in the side. So um, please, if you can spend a little more time with the speakers, that would be wonderful. And again, thank you so much for your attention today.